Um, so we can go ahead and get started. Today we have Colin Bennett and Peyton Strickland. They're going to talk about their experiences at Blue Origin and United Launch Alliance. Um, and then after that, we'll open up for questions. If you have questions, you can either send them in the chat or speak up when we ask for them. But otherwise, I think we're good to go ahead and get started. Does one of you guys want to go first or would you like me to pick? Colin, you want to go first since you got the slides already up, buddy? <laughs> sure. <laughs> awesome. Um, da -da -da. Let's see if presenting hurts. All right. Um, can y'all see it full screen? Yep. Sweet. Okay. Uh, so I work for Blue Origin, um, and our, our motto is millions of people living and working in space to benefit Earth. It's uh, something we added recently, but basically the whole goal of our company is just to increase the uh, technology that we use to get to space. So everything that Blue does is meant to increase our capability in getting stuff into space and beyond. Uh, so I'll skip the, the mottos and everything, but uh, basically our four big programs are New Shepard, which is our suborbital rocket that you will be able to see launches of on a regular basis, including one coming up sometime in the next month or so. Uh, New Glenn, which is our next rocket that I work on, um, and then engines. So we have several engines that we're working on concurrently to support New Shepard, New Glenn, and ULA, and then our advanced development program, which encompasses all of our future technologies and some of our other projects, such as the moon lander that we're working on for NASA. So our first rocket is New Shepard. Uh, again, you can go online and find literally dozens of launches of this and its earlier prototypes. Um, basically, it goes uh, up to above the Kármán line, it launches a capsule, uh, and our paying customers can look out the window and experience zero G and become astronauts for a small fee. So it's a it's a pretty exciting program. We're getting to a really cool stage. Where we're actually about to to launch astronauts in the next few months or so. Um, New Glenn is our orbital class rocket um, that will eventually take us to the moon and put large payloads into LEO, GEO, and beyond. Um, so you can see here is the scale of these two rockets. And uh, at the very bottom down there, that is a human. And I can verify that New Shepard is large. It is a large honking rocket. And uh, this is much, much larger. It's, it's pretty insane how big this is. Uh, so if you look right here, uh, this is BE3U, it's our upper stage engine. So I, I work on the little dot right there, all of the stuff in there, and that right there is as tall as I am. So it's a, it's a very, very big rocket. Um, so we have uh, several locations. This is our um, second newest location in Florida where we build the rockets, um, and we roll them out to the pad, which you can see in the distance there. Uh, this is a rendering of our pad. Uh, the earth moving and everything going on there is pretty insane. Um, I'm sure eventually we're gonna, you're going to see some drone footage of stuff uh, going on there, but it's truly incredible how much money and how much uh, like physical investment we're putting into the land around there. Uh, really exciting right now is the Blue Moon system. So it's basically our lander uh, we're going to use to take astronauts to the moon competing against a couple other companies uh, for that project, but it's been really cool seeing all of that work going on concurrently. It's a little hush-hush even within our company, so we don't get to see a lot about it, so please don't ask me questions about it, uh, but it's, uh, it's pretty cool to see us working on that. Um, and then what I'm most familiar with are rocket engines. Um, it's, it's a huge part of Blue. Right now we have a big contract with ULA to deliver BE-4s for their Vulcan rocket, and I work on BE3U for New Glenn and on top of BE4. And then we also have BE7 for uh, our moon lander. 
So B3 is for New Shepherd, B3U is for the upper stage of New Glen, B4 is for the first stage of New Glen, and B7 is for Blue Moon. Uh, so pretty exciting for all of y'all. Um, being in Alabama, as we have an engine factory that's getting up and running, uh, it's going to be mostly supporting manufacturing. So if you are interested in manufacturing at all, there are going to be some opportunities opening up there within the next year and the years after. So that's pretty exciting. And then also in Huntsville, we have NASA Marshall Test Stand 4670. So if you're familiar with uh, engine testing, um, we have a gigantic stand in Alabama that we are leasing from NASA, and we're going to be testing BE4 there and possibly some other engines in the future. So here you can see all of our locations. Uh, the one in DC is basically just to support all of our government uh, interactions. And Van Horn is where we do all of our engine testing right now. And we'll continue doing engine testing there in the future. Uh, and then also we have another location in California. It's our engines design office. And so we'll have a few purely design roles opening up there in the next few months. Uh, so our internship opportunities are pretty limited. Um, we have, I think this past year, we had like 27 interns um, and obviously we get a lot of applications for it. So it's really important that you know how to apply to these. Um, the biggest thing to, to know is that, um, and this goes for every application that you do forever, is uh, applications are first come first serve. So if your resume is the first one in the stack, your resume will be the first one to get read, which means you have the highest chance of getting hired. That's not just a blue thing, that's an everybody thing. So if you apply to a job the day it opens, you have a better chance of getting that job the day after and the day after that. So you should have your resume ready to go as soon as you're ready to think about applying. You should, that should be the first thing you do. And as soon as you see a job application open up, you need to apply to it. But again, it goes for everything else beyond blue as well. Um, so we have opportunities in the spring, summer, and fall. If I were you, and it's something that you can think you could handle, I would go for a fall or spring internship. Your chances of getting a fall or spring internship are much higher than getting a summer one. That again goes for every other internship opportunity besides blue. Most people apply for summer internships. Um, and then once you're closer to graduation, we have our early career program. Uh, so that's uh, similar to what I did, I actually got into a role um, that wasn't technically early career because it was a uh, high need. Um, but most of our roles for, for recent graduates are listed as early career. And you can find those on our website. Um, right now uh, is not the best time to apply to those. Um, but come February 1st is when I was told that you should be looking again to apply. Um, that's when a bunch of our early career options are going to open up again. Uh, so that's everything I have strictly related to Blue. Now about myself personally, I'm a manufacturing engineer. So uh, that's a, it's a pretty scary title, I'm sure, to hear from an aerospace engineering perspective because it sounds like something a mechanical engineer would be more inclined to do. Um, but I can promise you that everybody at Blue Origin is basically a mechanical engineer, an electrical engineer, and an aerospace engineer. Building rockets is not a single discipline subject. Everybody has to know everything about everything. I've had to learn all about chemicals, all about metallurgy. There's a ton of different things to do involving all sorts of disciplines, and you do need to know all of them. You need to have a basic understanding. That's why you take chemistry, that's why you take intro to electrical engineering or uh, material science. Um, so as a, as a manufacturing engineer, my job is basically to ensure that we get the stuff from design to reality. So I'm, a, I'm in the, the design phase right now. So right now we're working through all of the designs. I'm working with uh, all of our welders and all of our additive manufacturing folks, and I'm determining what is the best way to manufacturing things, what's the cheapest way to manufacturing things, and what is the best way to manufacture things. And it's a balance, right? So that's been my job for the past year, almost now, which is crazy to think about. Um, but it's, it's been quite an adventure. And uh, if, if I had 
a recommendation for what kind of dad to look for, I'd say care less about the title and care more about the size of the team because working on a small team is really, really cool because you get to do a lot of things and you have a very fun time working with budgets, I'd say. So um, with that, I will pass it back over to Jane. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and then now we're gonna have Peyton go. And if you have any questions, um, you can ask them after they're both done. Also, I said this in the chat, but please turn on your cameras if you're able, just so it feels less like speaking into the void for Peyton and Colin. <laughs> You're muted. <laughs> I got it. There we go. Let me get that pulled back up. So can everyone see the uh, see the slide here? We're good to go on that aspect. All right. So this presentation, uh, again, so my name is Peyton Strickland, and this presentation won't be as formal as Col Collins, and we'll have his three slides. And there's kind of two reasons for that. So one, as Jane said at the beginning of this, I currently do not work for United Launch Alliance. I interned there this summer, and I did accept an offer to be working there uh, starting in January. And so I didn't, you know, this is not a formal ULA presentation. It's more of a my experiences at ULA presentation and then what I'll be kind of working on come January. And the second reason why is, so we're really fortunate. Uh, it's really cool that, you know, Colin's presenting here tonight. This is actually the first Blue Origin presentation I've ever seen uh, during my five years here at UA. So it's, you know, that's really, really awesome for us. And so we, you know, we have ULA speakers who come to AIAA all the time and talk. So most recently, Pam came and talked about ULA. So, she, you know, she gave kind of the more formal, this is ULA, this is where our locations are. And because of that, you know, we're gonna focus more on my specific background and experience with this and how, you know, ARA prepared me for the United Launch Alliance. So, as I said, I am graduating this December with my master's in aerospace engineering and mechanics. And then I got my bachelor's in May. So both from the University of Alabama, so it's been a lot of fun going here. During my time in college, I've been really fortunate to have a total of five internships. So I worked for two years in between power systems, uh, working on electric utility power infrastructure. So that kind of stuff, we're talking, anything you see on the power lines, I was working on. So we made a lot of the aluminum components for the power lines, the fiberglass components for the power lines and things like that. And so that was kind of a mechanical engineering role. And that kind of helped, we did a lot of uh, manufacturing as well. So learning about heat treat processes and um, learning about how, you know, aluminum, you know, how do you melt the aluminum and actually create molds to create the products. And so that was a lot of fun. Kind of gave me a good background and understanding the difficulties in manufacturing. And then from there, uh, I was fortunate enough to finally get a aerospace internship at the Meyer Corporation doing missile defense. So I spent two summers there and I got to work on missile defense uh, for the missile defense agency, working on trajectory modeling and optimization of three stage rockets, which was really cool because, you know, ultimately I knew I wanted to work on, you know, rockets at United Launch Alliance, Space Sets, Blue Origin, those kinds of rockets. But, you know, this was a, a way that, you know, although I couldn't get those internships at SpaceX and ULA yet, I knew this was a good stepping stone to get me to where I wanted to be. And so, you know, that's kind of, you know, one of the things you'll have to do along the way is sometimes you got to figure out how you want to get to where you're going. And so the Meyer Corporation was a great stepping stone for getting me to United Launch Alliance, where I was able to work this summer on rocket propulsion. I'll talk more about that in a couple of slides. And so how did I get these internships? And really the, the number one way I was able to do that was with project experience that I got on Project Polaris, uh, which was during my junior year. We worked on a two-stage solid rocket. So I had to help out with that some. And then really I got involved with the Alabama Rock Tree Association during senior design, working on Aries 5. We had a lot of fun, as Jane knows. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. And then most recently now, I'm the propulsion team lead for Aries 6. So some of you 
get to work under me, which I'm sure is a lot of fun. Not really. I'm kind of like Liam, as we talked about earlier. A lot of work. We got, we got a lot of work left to do. And then, so I'm from Pelham, Alabama, which is basically Birmingham. It's 20 minutes south of Birmingham. So, you know, not too far from, from home, you know, hour west. Tuscaloosa is an hour west from Pelham. So it's been a lot of fun. Um, so that's just kind of initial background on so some of my experiences. So first, we're going to kind of talk about the internship process. And I know a lot of you are sophomores and juniors and even some freshmen working on trying to get internships so that you can ultimately get a job. And, you know, the first step that everyone kind of misses before you apply is networking. And so, you know, networking is really important. And you've probably heard that from some of your professors in your freshman year, sophomore year about the importance of networking. But I can really say it's important, especially for the aerospace community. You'll always hear people talk about how tight knit the aerospace community is, how small it is. And because there's only so many and people in the world who are qualified to work on rockets. And so because of that, everyone knows everyone. You meet each other at the NAA conferences and you have those opportunities to network with them. And then ultimately, because you're, you know, you're an aerospace engineer, you're going to have to, you're going to cost a lot of money to hire. They want people who are going to be hiring these engineers. They want to know that they can trust the person they're hiring and they're going to have to spend all that time training. And then also you're going to have like ITAR restrictions in terms of, you know, trade secrets. So companies don't want to feel comfortable in knowing, hey, this person's a trustworthy person. He's not going to go to this other company and divulge our secrets, things like that. And so the first really step before you even start applying is to network. You know, I can say that this summer, pretty much everyone I talked to uh, knew someone at the company who helped them get their internship. You know, they, they knew one of the manufacturing engineers and because, you know, pretty much at every company you have the opportunity, you know, someone at that company has the opportunity to recommend an, an intern and say, hey, this person would be a great person to hire. You know, they know the college recruiters. And so that's really a huge step is getting that network together so that you can have them, you know, have them help rec recommend you. And I want to preface this by saying, you know, a great way to do this is throughout, you know, our, as you saw a couple of weeks, I guess last weekend, we had our PDR presentation with some of the industry people. And so, you know, when you're presenting at those presentations and getting the feedback and talking to them about how everything's working, and that's a great chance to network. But networking doesn't look like this. It doesn't look like, hey, I saw that Peyton worked at United Launch Alliance. So he's now working at United Launch Alliance. I've never talked to him before, but now I'm going to email him and say, hey, can you get me a job? You know, that's not what networking looks like. You know, it's, it looks bad on you. It looks bad on, like, it just looks bad because, you know, I have somebody who I know nothing about asking me for a job and just doesn't, you know, it doesn't send the right message. And so definitely don't be that person to where you've never talked to someone, but you just know, oh, they were on Alabama the Rocket Tree. Hey, can you get me a job? And that's not the way to network. You know, the way to, to kind of network is to work together on these projects so that they have experience. They know what the recruiters want to know. Like, hey, this guy's hardworking. I work with him on this project. He really is passionate about this stuff. So just make sure you're networking correctly. And this time during college is really a great way to have an opportunity to network with the aerospace professionals who are the alumni from Alabama Rocket Tree. So then once you network, you've got your people ready to you know, write you recommendations, then you can start the application process. So it's the Tuesday following Labor Day, pretty much every year United Launch Alliance, the Tuesday following Labor Day opens up their application. As Colin said, first come first serve. They're only gonna take so many people. On average, it's between 60 and 70 people per, per, like per job internship open. That's how many people you're competing against. So that you're gonna have to be selected that one person out of the 67 you know, 70 people who applied for your opening. And so it's very competitive. And that's again, why that networking really helps because, you know, hey, if, if our vice president or our engineering lead for this section is saying, hey, this intern's really passionate about aerospace, we should hire them. It really gives you that leg up. So the other great thing you can do for ULA is you know that the application is going to be Tuesday following Labor Day. You know, that's the thing that kind of really stinks about full-time job openings is you never know when they're going to pop up. And so I call and said, you just always have to be ready, have your internship ready, have your notifications on for whenever they do randomly pop up. 
But here we know there are always going to be Tuesday falling Labor Day. And the other great thing is you can edit your profile over the summer and weeks leading up to Labor Day. They have that, you know, your profile always open where you can upload new resumes and things like that, which really helps you on the day of, all you have to do is actually fill out the application. You don't have to worry about updating your profile, updating your resume on the system. All you have to worry about is filling out the specific application. And the application for an internship is pretty quick. And so then that's, you know, hopefully we'll get an interview. And so during the interview process, it's really important to understand the company that you're applying for. You know, know what's important to that company. And know the culture. So United Launch Alliance, right? They're really passionate about their 100% mission success. And that's, you know, a huge thing to be proud of coming up on 140 something, I think it's like 141 maybe, uh, rockets launched successfully without a failure. So that is a huge thing for them. And so a lot of times you'll get questions about, hey, you know, like when they're asking interview questions, questions about, you know, is it better to finish something fast, you know, in, in terms of hitting the deadline, or is it better to do it correctly? And those kinds of questions where understanding the company, understanding the culture of why 100% mission success is really important. Whereas, you know, some other companies like Space Sets are really, you know, they are really passionate about testing, you know, testing quickly, and it's okay to fail, just so they can speed up that timeline. So understand what that company wants during, you know, wants you to be passionate about. It's really important when you're doing, getting to the interview process. And, you know, also talk to previous interns, talk to anyone you know, you might be able to say, hey, do you know what kind of questions they typically ask? Are they asking, you know, these kinds of questions, more technical questions? All of those things can help you get ready for the interview process. And then be location independent. This one's huge. Because again, like I just said, if you're applying for basically one in 67, you know, like you're, you're going against 67 people for every job opening. Well, where it really gets even worse is when you say, hey, I'm only willing to work in Denver. Everyone wants to work in Denver. That's you know the place to be right now. Everyone wants to work in Denver. Jane wants to be in Denver. Uh, so just know everyone wants to be to Denver. And so when you just say, hey, I'm only willing to go to Denver, I'm not willing to be in Harlingen, Texas. I'm not willing to be in Decatur, Alabama. You're just killing yourself to where you're just making it almost impossible to get an internship. So for me, you know, I actually was really fortunate. I went to Cape Canaveral, Florida this summer which you're like, oh, well, you know, he just applied and said he was going to Cape Canaveral. No, they, I interviewed, I said, I was willing to go anywhere. And they said, are you willing to go to Harlingen, Texas? And I said, yes, I would go anywhere for this job opening. And I got sent to Harlingen, Texas. Well, that's where they said they were going to send me. And then COVID hit. Because of COVID, they really wanted to get all the interns. There's only going to be me and two other interns in Harlingen, Texas. And they thought that, you know, Texas was getting really hit with COVID and, you know, that, you know, it's a really remote location. And then also there's only three of us. So it's kind of, you know, adding somebody else to have to worry about keeping track of students. But they said, you know, we need to transfer y'all to another location so that we can kind of have an easier chance to monitor the situation for, for our interns. So they asked me then, where do you want to go now? And I got really fortunate and I had to say, hey, I want to go to Cape Canaveral. So again, you know, being location independent, really paid off for me and that you know if i would have said denver i'm not sure i would have got an internship because i said i was going willing to go anywhere i ended up getting that harlingen position which ultimately allowed me to get transferred to cape canaveral and so then also with being location independent the hardest part about getting into a company is just getting in like that's the hardest part and then once you get in with the company they're always very willing to work with you like hey where do you want to go intern next or where do you want to work now and pretty much every single time they'll meet that you know, we had a bunch of almost every single intern at Cape Canaveral said, oh, I want to go to Denver next summer. And almost every single one of them got their job offer for Denver. So again, location independent, the most important part is getting into the company. And then lastly, thank people for their time. This is a huge thing that a lot of people miss these days. But it's really important that regardless if you get the internship or not, you know, like as soon as you finish your, your interview, write thank you notes. Say, hey, I really appreciate you taking the time. You know, it's not hard. It's a really simple step, but it really shows people like, hey, this guy's really, you know, he really cares about other people investing in him. And he's very, you know, willing to, to you know, to listen, get feedback. And he doesn't really care about the ultimate result. He's just passionate about space. So thanking people for their time is a really easy way to make a, a huge impression on everyone.
So finally, let's talk about uh, my internship experience. So as you can see here in the bottom, in the, uh, I guess, middle left, we have me in front of the Delta IV Heavy Rocket. So that was really cool to kind of get there, to be in front of that. And then on the right, we have the Mars 2020 mission, which is another really exciting mission we got to work on this summer. So my official title this summer was Propulsion Test Engineering Intern. So first we'll kind of cover my operational activities. So a lot of what you'll see in Cape Canaveral is operational. So it's just making things get ready for the launches. You know, there's all the manufacturing is really done in Decatur and they ship, you know, the, the components to us, we stack them and then we get ready for launch. So the operational activities consist of, uh, that I worked on consist of the lot, so liquid oxygen and LH2, which were hydrogen offloads. So if you look at Cape Canaveral, if you ever get the chance to go tour, you'll see these huge spherical tanks and they are what store the liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen before we're able, we're able to put them on the rockets. You know, they're really, they're vacuum tight and so that, you know, they, we don't have a lot of boil off. And ultimately we, you know, right before we launch, we fill up the rockets with that uh, LOTS and LH2 right before launch. And so we have to ultimately fill those huge spherical tanks with all these tankers of liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen so I got to work on, you know, helping them offload it from the tankers into the spherical tanks. I also got to work on a hydrazine load, which was really exciting. Uh, hydrazine is a very scary word. Um, basically, it's, you know, super toxic and you don't want to be around it. You always have to wear these, it's, it's, these escape suits so that you have your, you know, if there's any spills that happen, you have self-contained breathing apparatuses. Uh, it's a very dangerous stuff, but pretty much every, um, Spacecraft is going to use it. A lot of different things use hydrazine as their fuel because it is, it's a modern propellant, which is very nice. I don't want to get too much into, you know, rocket propulsion, but uh, it's very dangerous and it's a lot of fun to work on, uh, to work with. So hydrazine loads were a lot of fun. And then kind of the next two are really cool, just kind of from a propulsion standpoint. So RS-68 nozzle sluice, so the Delta IV heavy engine. Uh, the big, you know, the first stage engine, we have RS-68. And so while the, you know, while it's up there, we got to slew the, do some slew tests to make sure that the nozzle was able to be slewed during flight for trajectory, you know, whenever you want to pitch over, things like that. And then we also did a RL-10 nozzle deployment test uh, for the second stage of the RL-10. Um, and so that was really cool to get to see just because you know, again, the RL-10 is kind of like the, you know, the holy grail of engines for second stage. It's got like the highest ISP. And so it's really cool to kind of see what, you know, the RL-10 engine, because you read so much about it in textbooks and things like that. So that was a lot of fun. And then lastly, like rocket ship receiving. So again, I encourage you to kind of look at it. They have this huge uh, cargo ship and on it, they will put the, the, the boosters for like the Delta IV Heavy, the Atlas booster, uh, things like that, and it, it's a lot of fun to, you know, get on that ship and then kind of help watch it be taken off and driven on the roads. So that was a lot of fun. And I also got to see the Antonov. So the Antonov is kind of the Russian, it's the world's largest plane, and they put, uh, they'll put some boosters and stuff like that in the Antonov and then fly them over, or really a lot of the uh, RUAG uh, payload bearings as well. So that was really cool to see. So that was my operational activities that I got to work on. And then from there, I actually had some major projects that were the main things that I was focused on. So first, the Delta IV Heavy Swing Arm PLC redundancy test. So in the left picture, you can see kind of those almost like ladder looking things uh, attached to the rocket from the left structure. And so those are swing arms. So basically, if you ever watch the Delta IV Heavy launch, you'll see that pretty much at lift off, they start retracting those things away from the rocket and so I was working on the PLC system, um, which is basically the computer that controls the swing arm movement. And that was really cool for me. It was a task that I was, wasn't very familiar with. I haven't taken any PLC classes or things like that. So that was a lot of fun uh, kind of learn about. And then console operator screens. Um, as you can imagine, when we do a launch, we have some proprietary operator screens that are specific to the Atlas rocket, specific to the Delta IV Heavy. And because of that, we have to make sure that those console screens are easy to use and easy to understand. So I got to work on making some of those. And then auto files, which is mainly used on the Atlas rocket. 
and it's basically kind of like it's based in C almost, but it's, it's, it's almost its own language in itself. And with that, it runs a lot of like auto, it's an automation uh, software almost to kind of help with checking things. So I wrote an auto file to kind of detect some faults uh, in case any of the systems malfunctioned on the Atlas. And basically it's just basically always looking, looping through and trying to find any faults uh, in any of the you know, measurement um, comparisons, things like that. And the coolest project I got to work on this summer was a special project for March 2020, critical ground support equipment. Uh, I can't talk too much about it because of it's proprietary and it's also ITAR restricted, uh, but this is really cool. It had to deal with the, so, with the um, solid rocket mating on the Atlas V for March 2020. And so me and a couple other interns got to work on this project and it allowed us to work like 60 hours one week. And it was a lot of fun just getting to work on that. And so we had a lot of fun with that. So then, yeah, so that's one of the questions you might be asking is like, why ULA? Like, you know, why is ULA, why do people work at ULA over space sets or why are people fans of ULA over space sets? And you, it really comes down to, you have to understand that every company has its purpose. And so this kind of, I think this is a great chart for understanding why, you know, why does ULA exist? Why does space sets exist? So ULA, as you can see, every single interplanetary mission that's ever been done has been done by ULA. As you can see, you've got Moon, Interstellar System, Mars, Jupiter, Pluto. Every Mars mission has been ULA, which is really cool. Um, so it's, you know, whenever you're talking about very specific orbital insertions in deep space, ULA is the company to do that because of that RL3 engine and some of our other capabilities. Then you'll get space sets. Space sets is great at low Earth orbit, so taking a lot of mass to low Earth orbit, and they're doing a lot of GTO as well. And so again, as you can see here, that's kind of the main difference. So that's the first main difference is you have ULA, which is really great at doing a lot of interplanetary missions, where SpaceX can do a lot of mass to low Earth orbit. Another reason why is you know ULA is very well is known for, again, 100% mission success. As you can see, there's no red X's on the ULA side. Uh, so that's 100% mission success as the United Launch Alliance, whereas SpaceX has had a couple of failures. And so again, when you're talking, Mars 2020 mission was the most expensive human-made object ever. And when you're talking cost difference of 20 million, 10 million, you know, I think the, the Mars 2020 rover was somewhere around $3 billion. And so when you're talking about $3 billion, why am I that concerned about $20 million, $10 million? You know, when we're talking something that took 10 years to make, it's $3 billion, $2 billion, you know, $20 million, $10 million, whatever that number is, it's really not that much in the grand scheme of things to where I'm willing to pay a little bit more to have that 100% mission success. And then also ULA is the gold standard and, or has been the gold standard for uh, keeping schedules, launch schedules, and making sure that we're hitting our intended launch date, which is really important for interplanetary missions such as Mars 2020, where you only have so long before you have to wait two years to launch again because you're you're running out of that uh, you know the least fuel intensive launches, and so that's again why why ULA is chosen a lot for those Mars 20 missions, things like that, and you know. The, Obviously, they'll have to stay, stay competitive in the future. And Blue Origin, is from, like, like Colin said, is working on New Glenn. Uh, so it's a very exciting time to be in space. But I thought this would be a great slide to kind of talk about why do some people, you know, why is ULA exist? Why does space science exist? Um, so it's, it's a very uh, informative slide. And then lastly, so January 11th, 2020. So this is when I'm starting full time as a propulsion test engineer at Cape Canaveral. So I'll be working on Slick 41, which is Atlas, Slick 37, Delta 4 Heavy, and Vandenberg. So I'll have the joys of flying to Vandenberg whenever there's a launch of the Delta 4 Heavy or Atlas in Vandenberg, California, and working on those launches, which will be a lot of fun. Um, Console-wise, they're saying I'm going to work mainly on P&E and MEQ. So P&E is pneumatics, so I'll be working on like valve actuation on the rockets, and which is purge system, purging systems as well. And the MEQ, which is for really Delta IV Heavy, that will be the swing arms, which is kind of what I worked on this summer. And 
has gas or you know just making sure there's no um, oxygen leaks things like that on the rocket is kind of thrown in to MEQ as well and then again again as we talked about there's the Atlas 4 Atlas 5 and the Delta 4 heavy and then Vulcan Centaur is actually on track to launch in uh, 2021 which we're very excited about if um, so that's you know very, very exciting and as you can see it's 90 percent flown before initial launch capability so there's a lot of trust in what we're working on and then as you can see also the very bottom BE4 engines you know, that's Blue Origin so very excited to be working with Colin uh, Colin's company on that as well so we're very excited about the future and I'm very excited to be working for United Launch Alliance and with that I'll turn it back to Jane. Awesome thank you so much um, so now we can open up for questions does anyone have any questions that you'd like to ask Colin or Peyton? Uh, 